me as we pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Okay, well, if you would take your Bibles now and turn with me to John chapter 13. We're back in John, knowing that... Sometimes your preacher doesn't have a super long attention span, and so therefore, you know, preaching all the way through 1 Samuel in one run, you know, it would just, I would, I'd get bored with it and abandon it halfway through. So we're going to kind of go back and forth because we are in the month that we celebrate really and truly the high point of what we believe in. Every religion you can track down has at least some notification and some note take some notice of the birth of their founder they take some notice of creation and other worship days and and even you know Judaism has the day of atonement Islam has the Hajj and all of the things that go on in the month of Ramadan Buddhism has its cycles and everything else we are the only ones who get to celebrate that God died for us and rose from the dead for us and if that doesn't get you excited then take the little bit of excitement that comes from Reese's peanut butter eggs and then just try to build on it, okay? Because it's Easter and we get to celebrate the grandest thing of all and that is Jesus rose from the dead and we also get to celebrate chocolate and peanut butter together which is at least one of the top 100 greatest things that God has allowed humanity. Come on, work with me, people. This is what we got. I was going to say, there should be some amens there, because I know some of y'all. I see your social media. If you find, when you find John 13, if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, we're going to take from verse 12 down to about verse 20, and then we'll talk about what's going on here. So, um, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet... You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. And I speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it, it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to us by it today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we have, we're leading up to the Lord's Sup, to uh, the crucifixion, and this is one of those spots, almost half of the book of John is given over to the events that happen in what we call Holy Week or the Passion Week. Most of, you know, most of the other Gospels spend at least a couple of chapters on that last week of the life of Jesus. And if we're really going to preach through all of it or go through all of it every year, we either have to come to church every day from Palm Sunday until Easter, which is, by the way, spring break week. I figure some of y'all ain't going to be around. Or we have to back up and, and take several Sundays leading up to it. So, you know, to, to be ready so that I don't want Ed to miss it because I know he's going to be on the beach, you know, just kind of. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> Better not be. He's supposed to be getting healthy. Um, but it, we we got to take a few minutes and look at some of these things that occur. That look at the things that build up to this. Because as we are learning as God's people to walk with Jesus, we need to realize that there are steps every day. There are things that go on every day in our everyday life. And it is not that the crucifixion was just this accident, nor was it just a moment that there wasn't a preparation for, that Jesus was in the middle of other stuff, and then they finally caught up to him and crucified him, but that it was part of the plan. It was part of what God established. And in fact, as we come to this, which occurs in the, in the Last Supper... And we see that Jesus and his disciples have gathered to eat the Passover. We should realize something. The Passover is established approximately, well for us, 3,500 years ago. It's established about 1,400 years before the time of Christ. It's established 1,400 years before Jesus sits down with Peter and James and John and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas and everybody else that we can't remember. And can't spell. If 
about 1,400 years before that, God established that his people would be delivered from death, delivered from slavery in Egypt in a night. And in that night, they would celebrate by taking a perfect lamb, as perfect as they could find, and sacrificing it. That they would establish a new covenant with God where they took and ate of bread that reminded them of that. And that they would go forward into a new life where God had made them into new people and taken them from slavery and made them his people to be a light to the nations. And if you'd like a summary of about the first, 10, first 15, 16 chapters of Exodus, there you go. That's what God does. And so the pattern for the Last Supper is set 1,400 years in advance. You know, some of us have trouble pulling off plans that we set in advance six months ago. God set this plan in advance 1,400 years ago? No. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 3, you see a promise that, this, that the head of the serpent that deceives and brings death would be struck by the seed of the woman. See, from time before we counted time, this was planned. I can't always make sure that I execute eating for lunch what I thought I'd eat for lunch that, that morning when we, plan, when we sat down with the menu plan. And yet God, from before he founded the world, had the intention that Jesus would come and would die. And that he would raise from the dead on the third day. We don't want to wait until Easter before we get to the resurrection. Everything we do should be soaked in that. Because it's not bad news. There's no bad news in Scripture. Because we have the whole thing. That has some bad news. It feels bad for Peter and James and John and the whole lot of them as they see Jesus go to the cross. But we get to go ahead and turn the page and read the next chapter. And so as we read this, we get to recognize that, that everything is finished. That the great message of the gospel is that everything is finished. And in fact, that's where we're going for with this. First of all, they're gathered together for the Passover, and that is to, to celebrate what God has done for them. It's not a bad idea. We should gather together from time to time and celebrate what God has done for us. Don't you think? Realize that's a big part of what we should be doing as a church on Sunday mornings, gathering to celebrate the great things that God has done for us. That's why so many of our songs are things like, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. It's a great song. Goes better with a banjo, though. We don't have one of those right now. But um, we should celebrate that. We should come together and celebrate the fact that you know, it is through the power of the gospel and through the Holy Spirit dwelling in our lives that God enables us to be better at what we do, at, 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 at reflecting God's glory and how we live, whether it's when we go to work tomorrow or as husbands, as, as wives, as mothers, fathers, grandparents, as whatever God has put in front of us. That we come together and we celebrate that. The disciples gather with Jesus. They gather in a small group in this case. Sometimes they're in big groups. Sometimes they're in small groups. We need both. Some things are best learned and some relationships are best built when you have a small group of people sitting around a table having a meal. Now many of us, we've got a little bit of a wrong picture of the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. This is the Last Supper from which we get the Lord's Supper. Because, you know, that great classic piece of da Vinci's art that has all of them where it seems like the unrecorded line from Scripture is the last words of Jesus at the Last Supper were everybody this side of the table for a picture because everybody's on one side of it. Work with, that's all I've got. That's the only thing funny I can find here today. Everybody on one side. Where they've got everybody kind of stretched out and you've got all 13 people on one side. Really, they're sitting around that table together. And they're actually shoehorned into a space that's a little too small for them. Because that's why they're all kind of piled up. But there was a closeness, there was a fellowship that came from walking with Jesus together that it wasn't that big of a problem. And I want to encourage you 
that if you are not involved in a small group of believers gathering to study the Word of God and to learn to walk with Jesus together, you need to be in that group. It's one of the reasons we're going to do that Sunday school breakfast next Sunday morning is to try to get folks a little bit, give our Sunday school teachers a day, a, a Sunday to go, take a breath, but also get together and encourage and remind to be a part of this. And if you don't have a Sunday school class that you're a part of, we want to encourage you to show up and eat breakfast next Sunday. And find some people that you can go to Sunday school with. There are some classes that would love to have you. And if you can't find a class you fit in, we're going to start another class that is going to meet in a sanctuary for starters, and that will start the next Sunday. Now, I cannot guarantee the quality of the teaching with that class. Because the guy that teaches typically wears a tie and those cut off circulation to his brain. But um, also the jokes aren't any better than the sermons. So they won't get any, it won't be, there won't be any improvement there. But for starters, I'll be teaching that class. But we want to get, encourage you to be in and be a part of a fellowship that is growing and walking with Christ. Folks, the disciples walked with Jesus every day. They shared hotel rooms with him on the road. Okay? They shared, they rode together, or they were all in the same Honda because they were all together in one accord. Okay? Now you think about it. You put 13 guys in an accord, they are close. And yet still they took time. You see that they take time to come, Jesus says, come aside together with, with me for a while to pray. You see times that Jesus takes them aside to teach. You see them here where they are just a small group of folks gathering to learn. There's a time to be the big group which is this group, and there's a time to be the small group to help learn and to grow. We want to encourage you to be a part of that because it is a crucial step in learning to walk with Christ. Because we are not walking with Jesus to get together all by ourselves. We are together. We tend to think that we're together, but you stay over there and I'll stay over here. These guys are all in together, and that's in fact what God has going on. Gathering together to study, and then we see also that sometimes when we gather, there are wicked people amongst us. Judas is with these guys. Peter is with these guys. Now, we can talk all day about Judas and Peter and why they do what they do. Judas betrays Jesus because somebody had to. That's just the way Scripture had foretold it. Peter denies Christ. Peter is restored because he repents. Judas is not because he doesn't. Judas is sorry for what happens to him and because he thinks that it's a bad thing. But he's not actually repentant for the fact that what I've done is truly wrong. He says, what I've done is not really what I wanted to do. Many times our response to sin is more like Judas than Peter. Our response to sin is, well, that didn't turn out like I had hoped. And so I'm sorry that that didn't turn out like I had hoped. Folks, that's not being repentant before God and saying, God, I'm, I'm sorry that I sinned. You were right all along. It's just being sorry it didn't go like you wanted it to. Judas and Peter are still there. They're still welcome at the table. Jesus still washes their feet, which is what we have come to. They come in, they sit down, and it was typical of the time, because you're wearing sandals and walking dusty roads, that when you traveled, when you came into a place, a servant typically would wash your feet. Now, if you came into a place and it was some, a place where people were poor and nobody had the money to have servants, you washed your own feet because your feet were dirty. It was necessary. The disciples all come in and nobody does that. Nobody washes their own feet. There's not a servant there to wash because they don't have money. They don't have a huge amount of financial resources. After all, in a couple... It's not really a couple of chapters. You get into Acts, and it's you know, a few months down the, lo down the road, but Peter and John are able to look at a man who's begging and needs just a few alms for the day and say, look, silver or gold, I've got nothing. There's a whole other sermon to the fact that they were able to look at him and say, well, you know, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. We can look around the church these days and say, well, silver and gold we've got. We don't know much have that power anymore, though, do we? Might have traded in the wrong things. But nobody takes the time to wash the feet of the disciples. Nobody takes the time to wash the feet of Jesus. Here they are, these 12 guys have been following him. They're supposed to have been serving him. 
But instead, they all just kind of plop down and wait for somebody else to do it. Which makes them almost the perfect picture of so much of what we do in the church today. We sit down and we wait for somebody else to do it. You can hear Evelyn say amen back there because she knows how we deal with that. <laughs> Somebody's going to do it. We wait for somebody else to do it. Four billion people in the world today don't know Jesus, but hopefully somebody else will go tell them about him. 300 million people in America don't follow Jesus. Well, maybe not 300 million. Sorry, that's how many people there are total. About 200 million, 220 million don't follow Jesus. Hopefully somebody will go tell them. 75% of the people in Arkansas don't go to church on a regular basis, so that means they're probably not walking with Jesus. Second largest group of, you know, the, the largest religious group in Arkansas is undeclared. Folks, it's fine to be undeclared politically, but undeclared spiritually, that's death. Thousand people within a five mile radius of this church easily lost, dying, and going to hell. And the ones, some of them may not be lost and dying and going to hell. They may have accepted Christ. They may have surrendered to him. But they've walked away from church and they're living their life alone and without the touch of God's people and without the fellowship of believers. Somebody ought to do something about that. And most of us say that and then we sit in our seats in church and say, man, I wish somebody would do something about that. We're like the disciples. Let's sit here and hope somebody eventually serves. Let's sit here and hope somebody reaches into the places, reaches into the prisons and into the, the impoverished areas of our state where people need to hear the gospel. You say, oh, we don't want that. Can't be us. We don't want to risk those people coming here. They'll get the carpet dirty. They'll cause this problem and that problem. And yet what we find is that when we as the disciples sit around the table and hope somebody serves, realize something that Jesus takes up and does it. These are the people that Jesus would serve. Jesus serves the disciples, all 12 of them. Gets up, takes off his nice robe, grabs a towel and a basin of water and goes through and washes their feet. Takes on the responsibilities of a servant. This ties back to our memory verse for this month. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You think it didn't take some service for God to even come from heaven in the first place? To become obedient even to death on a cross. Jesus goes to his feet. He gets to Peter. And Peter, of all the disciples, at least goes ahead and says something. You kind of got a picture, you know, Thaddeus and you know, some of the other guys are sitting there going, I don't know what to say about this. Peter's got something to say. Peter's got something to say even if it's wrong. And Peter says, wait, you can't do this. And Jesus says, if I don't do this, then I have no part of you. Peter says, well, then not just my feet, but everything. You know, go ahead and just dump the bucket on me, Lord. It's not the ice bucket challenge, but close. As close as it gets in first century Palestine. I mean, they didn't exactly have ice. Yeah, or hot water, either one. Jesus says, you know, you're already clean. You've been with me. And this is something we've got to realize as God's people. We pick up a little bit of dirt here and there, and there are times that we need to take time, take that, those moments of repentance and say, Lord, I've picked this up and I need to set this aside. But Jesus tells Peter, you're clean already. Peter's clean by his relationship with Christ. Those of us who are walking with Jesus, if you've surrendered to Christ, you've been washed in the blood is the term that we use. Your sins are forgiven. Please learn something from what Jesus says to Peter here. You are clean already. You need to spend time going to the Word of God, growing in your walk with Christ so that you walk away from the sin because the more we Jesus, the more we see all those little individual things that we need to get away from. The more we see that, oh wait, this is actually selfishness. Ooh, that's actually greed. That's a lack of faith. Staying up all night worrying about this or stressing about that, that's a lack of faith. That's an insult to God. 
And the closer we come to Christ, the more we begin to understand that, the more we walk in that, and the more we see that we've got this and that to repent of. It's kind of like the better mirror you get, the more you realize you don't know how to shave. Missed a spot this morning, I can tell. I need to clean the mirrors at home. And sometimes we do that spiritually. We need to clean the mirror so that we can see to shave a little better. But you are not so clean, that you, you are not so dirty as a follower of Christ that you cannot pick up and find a way and a place to serve. See, Peter, I think, doesn't wash people's feet because he's thinking, well, I'm too dirty to do that in the first place. I think that's part of his re reasoning. Oftentimes, we sit in church and we don't serve because we say, well, I can't do that. I don't have it all together. Um, I hate to break it to you, but if you're looking for somebody that's got it all together and waiting for that person before you serve, I would like to encourage you to, to rethink that. Because that doesn't matter. And there may be one, per, one or two people in this church that have it all together, but I haven't met them yet. Or if I have, they've, they've hidden it really, really well. I don't know, maybe some of our choir folks have got it all together. I don't know, because I can't, I, they're making faces at me back there, but I just can't, I can't turn around and catch them at it. Folks, nobody's got it all together. We serve the way, the, the way that we are as we grow closer and closer to Christ. Many folks won't, you know, they don't come to church, they don't get involved, they say, well, you know, I'm not quite perfect enough yet. It's like saying, I'm not quite fit enough to go join a gym or to start exercising. You know what? You got to get up off the couch. Even if all you do is put a cinder block in the floor, walk around the block twice. It's a start. You've got to start someplace. Spiritually, you've got to start someplace and you've got to realize there's always room for improvement, whether it's in your life or in the life of the people that you follow. There are people that I follow spiritually that I lean on, that I depend on, that I look at to help me grow in my walk with Jesus. And I also see that there are times and places that they slip up and you know what we do? We pick each other up and we carry them on. Carry on. Because perfection is that goal that we strive for but we don't ever get there. It's about building the character as we walk with Jesus. And so you don't have to wait till you're perfect. You don't have to wait until you have perfect patience and you absolutely know that you can work with children without ten rolls of duct tape before you help with vacation Bible school. We as a church will help provide the duct tape if necessary. But you can help. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect to sing in the choir. You don't have to be perfect to help with the youth group or to help teach or to help just with some of the simple things that go on. Y'all realize everything, and this is, this is going to sound obvious, so I want everybody to listen because I'm going to give you something that sounds perfectly obvious and you're going to go, duh. So I want y'all to listen so you can all duh me at once, okay? Everything that needs done needs somebody to do it. Duh. Okay, I'm going to say it again. Everything that needs done needs somebody to do it. There are kids in the nursery. Somebody's got to ta change the diapers. There's trash to be taken out. Somebody's got to do it. Next week when we have, when we have breakfast together or any time we have a fellowship or we have a meal, somebody's got to sweep the floor. We need somebody to do it. And folks, we cannot, cannot say, well, somebody else will do it. We'll, we'll just hire that out. There are too many things that need done. Somebody's got to help make sure the bus stays clean. Somebody's got to make sure we've got, you know, bulletins not just printed but distributed. Somebody's got to take care of, you know, somebody's got to run sound. Somebody has to put stuff up there on the screen. You realize that's not magic, right? We don't just wave our hands and there it is. Somebody has to do that. You say, well, yeah, but Jacob does that. What are we going to do when we send Jacob on a mission trip for two weeks? Somebody else is going to have to do it. Jacob nodded off for a minute. He's awake now. So is Tammy. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. When we do things like when the East End Parade at Christmas time, or it's not really Christmas time, whenever it is, November 
Santa comes, so I guess it's a Christmas parade. When the East End Parade ends in our parking lot, somebody needs to be here to share the love of Christ with all these people that come flooding in here. It takes people to do it. So that's what we've got a preacher for. No. You know what you've got a preacher for? This. <laughs> now I get out there as a fellow believer and as a member of this church and pull my, pull my share of the weight. But that's what we need to be doing one for another. Somebody's got to teach Sunday school classes. We need more Sunday school classes so that we can help people grow in Christ. Somebody's got to teach them. Amen. So, that was your Sunday school director back there. <laughs> for working with kids, we need more people in children's Sunday school classes than just one adult. You say, oh, wait a minute. You can work with that. You can help out. You say, I wish the church would do this or do that, and I love when I occasionally get people come up to me and say, well, we've got this or we've got that, and so me and this person are going to take care of it. That's a beautiful thing. Amen. Because there's always stuff that needs doing. It's just sitting there saying, well, I wish somebody would do. I want to encourage you to take a long look in the mirror and say, you know what, I've been cleaned already. And I'm somebody I can do. So Jesus goes through and he serves. And in fact, what he points out to them is that, you know, look, you've got work to be doing. And your work is, starts with serving one another. And we've joked, some of us have joked about, you know, putting up a pulpit that I can be caged into. I think that's really what they're after. But the only reason that we actually have an elevated stage is just so that it's easier for the people in the back row to see. We're not up here because, ooh, we're higher. They're not up there because they're higher. We're up here because it's a Baptist church and most everybody's in the back. You've got to be able to see us somehow. It's either slope the floor like this or lift us up. We're here to serve one another. And when the minute we start looking at things in the church and saying, well, I'm not doing that. I'm only going to do it if I can get the attention drawn to me. I can, I'm only going to do it if it revolves around me. I'm only going to do it if it's done my way. We've stopped serving and we've gone to trying to lord it over one another. And if the way that you want to serve doesn't line up with the idea of being a person on the floor with a towel washing dirty feet... If it doesn't match that image, if it's instead about making sure people see you, know you, lift up all the amazing things that you are, then you've gone the wrong direction. Because Jesus knew who he was, and yet he still served. And I will tell you this, Jesus is more important in a church than all the rest of us. And about 5,000 times more important than the preacher. Folks, you can't have church without Jesus. You can have church without preachers. You can have church without music leaders. I've been in services that have been lacking in both. Doesn't mean there wasn't somebody doing it, just means that it was lacking in preaching or lacking in song directing, as the case may be. You don't have to have all these things. You can have church without a piano. I think you're missing something, but you can. You can have church without sound systems and lights. You can't have church without a building. But you can't have church without Jesus. And yet he serves. He serves the disciples. He kneels before them, washes their feet, and tells them, look, if I've done this, you ought to do this for one another. Now, a couple of realities else about this. Number one is, serve. Service is about us making that choice. It's not about you coming around saying, I've decided I'm going to give you the opportunity to serve. Here, wash my feet. That's not the attitude. We ought to come to church and come to one another. We ought to be coming, looking for, what's the way I can serve you today? You want to talk about something that will smooth out issues at your home? Try that. Get up in the morning, look at your spouse and say, how can I serve you today? Parents, look at your children and say, how can I serve them today? Now, sometimes they can be served by us teaching them responsibility and giving them chores to do. My own kids are 
Two of mine are helping a children's church and the third one is sick. So you won't see them cringe at that statement, but that's the truth. Parents, sometimes you serve your children by giving them structures to abide by. Okay? When you talk to that person that annoys you the most at work, look at them and say, how can I serve you today? When you go out to eat, look at your server and say, how can we serve you as you bring us our food? Say, wait a minute, what? Just look at them and say, how can I pray for you? Watch them get a little tweaky. Say, we're about to bless the food. Is there a way we can pray for you while we pray? Offer to serve them through prayer. Some of them will be grateful. Some of them will be, most of them will be baffled. It's an amazing event. And then they'll run off and fill somebody else's drinks and go on. Find ways to serve because the more ways that we actively seek to serve one another, the better we are learning to walk like Christ. And the next thing is this. How we serve may look a little bit different, but it will always do this. It will always bring glory and honor to the Lord more than it brings it to us. If you stop and think about it, think about the last five people that served you in some way. Do you remember their names? When you bought donuts this morning, do you remember who checked you out at Harvest Foods? When you went in to pay for your gas, the last time you paid for gas to a person, like five years ago, um, <laughs> do you remember the person at the checkout counter's name? Do you know your mailman's name? Some of you do. Who was the person that served you last time you had to stand there and get your tags renewed or your driver's license renewed? Do you remember their name? See, we tend to forget the people that serve. And so if we're going to serve Jesus, we have to embrace something very, very important, and that is someday we will be forgotten. Most of us don't like that. We don't want to be, oh, what's his name? We don't want to be that guy that used to do this or that lady that used to do that. We want to be remembered just like, oh, well, I remember how this person, and we can name off the last three people that did the job. We want to make sure that the next person that talks names four people, those three and us. We want our names on a sign or carved into the wood. We've got to be willing that the legacy we leave behind is there were disciples. There were 12 of them, Peter, James, John, and... All the rest of them. We've got to be willing to be, well, you know, this has been, there have always been good, faithful people here, and they've done this and they've done that. There are ways that we need to serve, and we need to be willing to do that for those around us. And finally, we see what Jesus tells them there at the end. He says, from now on, I'm telling you what's going to happen before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am. Around about a year ago, I gave you all a sermon about the way Jesus uses the phrase, I am, in the book of John. It's a reminder, and it goes right back to that place that the Passover came from. When God said, I am who I am, gave that as his name. And Jesus is telling them, this is what's about to happen. I'm about to be crucified. I'm about to die for your sins. Every last one of y'all, you who's going to deny me, you who's going to betray me, all of you who are going to run away, though you'll swear that you won't do it, all of you, you're going to run away, you're going to abandon me, you're going to leave me to face this alone to the point that instead of the disciples being there to minister to Jesus in the garden, God sends angels. Because all those who were supposed to be there with him have left him behind. What do we believe about him? Now that we can look back and see not only did he know beforehand, we can see exactly how it ends. And we know something else. There's a day coming that he's coming back. And when he does, he will look at whether or not we have taken this verse to heart. A slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. And we need to realize that we're the one who is the slave, and he's the master. We're the ones who have been sent. So have we lived like that? Or have we tried to say, I'm important. And everything else needs to revolve around me. I challenge you to let your service reflect the importance of Jesus 
more than the importance of who you think you are and let it work through him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We ask you, Lord God, to help us to serve you with our lives. It's in Jesus' name. That